There we are. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our next session right here with Larry Cooperman uh, from Night Dive Studios. And we are going to talk. He's going to talk about the business of games, a philosophical approach. Larry, I will give you the floor, good sir. Thanks, Dan. So um, let me start off by, uh, by, by giving a couple of uh, admissions to the audience. I, I haven't written a line of code in, in over 40 years. And I am possibly the least talented person in the world when it comes to graphics. Um, I'll also let you know that I am completely laughable when it comes to online gameplay. Yet um, somehow, despite uh, lacking all of these skills, I've been more than somewhat successful in the game industry. And I can honestly say that uh, I have fun every day. My, uh, my goal is to teach you some of what I've learned in the hopes that it contributes to your success. And again, this is entitled uh, A Philosophy for Success. This is not a, a business 101, but it's, uh, it's an attempt to show you how the, the lessons learned from business can be applied to every aspect of game development. Let me start off by uh, telling you uh, something of my, my own background. So uh, in 2001, I joined Stardock. I was uh, originally hired as, uh, as the sales manager being in charge of, of enterprise software sales. Um, the CEO there did mention to me that, oh, by the way, we also have a, a games division. Uh, over the next 11 years, uh, helped publish games including Galactic Civilizations 1 and 2, Sins of a Solar Empire, Demigod, uh, Elemental. Uh, during that time, we also built up uh, something called Impulse, which was for a time, the, I guess, the largest uh, Steam competitor. Um, because of the success of the Impulse platform, and, and I was the, the head of uh, business for that, um, I ended up joining GameStop when the Impulse platform was, was sold to them. My title over there was business development manager for uh, PC digital sales. Uh, at that time, GameStop was a Fortune 500, um, in fact, a, a Fortune 100 company. And I was one of the executives uh, being in charge of their new initiative to go into uh, PC digital. After, after leaving GameStop in uh, 2013, uh, I joined Night Dive Studios. I was the, uh, the fourth employee to join Night Dive Studios, um, stepped in as director of business development. Uh, since that time, we've published over 100 titles on Steam, GOG, Xbox, and Switch, uh, and have our first titles coming out for PlayStation for this, uh, this, this quarter. Uh, some of the games that we've worked on include System Shock and the Turok games, Blood Fresh Supply, which we did for Atari, and most recently, Doom 64, which we did for uh, Bethesda Software. Um, I'll also mention to you that I have uh, uh, a Bachelor's of Science from New York University, um, an MBA from Detroit Mercy, uh, where I was uh, became inducted as the MBA Scholar of the Year, member of Beta Gamma Sigma, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, I'll let you know that um, I have never, ever gotten a job in the games industry because of my education. So um, just just you want, might want to make a note about that. Um, in the media, uh, if you do a Google search on me, you'll find plenty of articles. One uh, for the uh, escapist that I did fairly recently began with, with my quote, uh, I say this all the time, the longest journey in gaming starts with the words, hey, you know what else would be cool? A quote that I hope you'll remember from me. Um, I've also been involved in, uh, you know, covered in places like VentureBeat. I always refer to uh, this as being a star of uh, stage, screen, and, and podcasts. But, but working with the media uh, is one area where we have been particularly successful. Um, we often like to say that we, we punch above our, our weight um, in managing media coverage. And, and a lot of that media coverage uh, translates into both visibility and in the long run sales. One of the other things that I want to tell you a little bit about my, my background is that uh, I'm active in uh, IGDA, the International uh, Game Developer Association. I'm one of the regional coordinators here in the United States. And uh, perhaps most Im importantly to me, um, I've been acknowledged for my volunteer efforts uh, working with both the, uh, the American Red Cross and the World Health Organization. So that's enough about me. Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about the business mindset as a philosophy and why I'm emphasizing this for you. If if you are uh, developers, odds are you've, you've never had uh, a background in business. You really don't understand how it can be applied to helping you in, in the everyday challenges that you meet. Um, well, I like to say it's, it's an approach to problem solving. It's analytical and data-driven, which in particular makes this uh, appealing to, to developers, I think. It's a guide for making decisions uh, for everything ranging from how you should design your game to, to hiring decisions. It's not just about profitability, but profitability is an important aspect of this philosophy. And uh, one of the things that we're going to do today is, is to put this into practice using an example, something that uh, occurs for, for a lot of developers. Um, how long should I work on my game and, and can I still be profitable? So why should, should you care about profitability? Well, <clears throat> for one thing, if you want game development to be your career, not just a, a hobby, um, personally, if you want to be happy in the business, the primary source of dissatisfaction that we see cited on development forums is a, a lack of compensation, specifically what I refer to as a, a disconnect between the amount of effort that we all need to put in to, to make a great game and the compensation, the reward we get for making that game. And what defeats us? Um, I'm going to say one of the primary contributors is a, a lack of business focus at the outset. And you need to ask yourself, how do we expect our games to generate money? How much money should we expect? And where will we sell our games? And, and what exactly will we sell? When you, when you start out to make a game, deciding on the business model should be as important a factor uh, as which platform or what engine you're going to use. Um, if you are creating a game design document, and I hope you all do, uh, the business factors should be uh, included in that. It should be something that you're thinking about from the, the very start. It's got to be part of your development roadmap. Um, before we get too heavy, this is a, a cartoon um, from Peach Butt that uh, I originally saw uh, posted on one of the larger game development uh, Facebook groups. Um, the, 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 the humor in it is that uh, the developer says, well, you know, we took over two years, barely paid ourselves to make the game. We, we put in every moment of the day trying to work at it, and we think that $15 is a fair price. And uh, instead, they, they get flamed by the audiences, and, you know, they get those uh, particularly toxic Steam reviews um, because, because people are upset that they're trying to make money. It's, it's funny, um, but it's also true. Uh, the developer in this cartoon figured out pricing based on the amount of, of effort and, and, and personal needs. Um, you know, how do you pay your bills? Not on the content of the game, and, and that's where, uh, that's where the, the disconnect took place. Uh, again, uh, keeping, it, keeping it pretty light, I think, uh, I think everyone is familiar with this. It's uh, from the South, Park's, uh, South Park episode with the underpants gnomes. Um, you know, phase one is collect everyone's underpants. Phase three is profit. Uh, phase three is always profit. Now, if they just had a, a phase two, um, this is this is famous, you know, and should be shown to uh, every time uh, someone comes up as the the idea guy. Um, but but frankly, I don't know anyone in the in the games industry or any of the affiliated industries that that isn't familiar with this, that hasn't seen this, and hasn't hasn't kind of nodded, saying, "Yeah, that's that's a real life thing that that happens to people." So we don't want to be those underpants gnomes. We don't want to be uh, trying to figure out what phase two is um, after we've uh, we've completed our game. We want to we want to have a linear path where all the steps are clearly defined that that leads us to profit. Okay, so this is going to be part of the, the math section. Um, I always uh, I always kind of, of laugh about that. Uh, didn't, didn't let you know if there was going to be maths in this presentation, but this is really simple. And uh, I, I put it in a particular way, and I, I kind of want you to pay attention to that. So costs. What are the costs of developing a game? Well, the, the probably the greatest one is the development time, but you also have to factor in the equipment, any licenses that you need for third-party software or um, middleware, your marketing spend, just about anything that you put into the game. 
and in, in order for us to be profitable, those costs must be less than revenues. And we'll talk a lot about revenues, but revenues can be sales revenues, ad revenues if you are an ad-supported game. Um, you want to look at uh, netting those revenues of, of platform fees, right? Steam, Nintendo, um, Google Play, Apple, um, all take their portion out of out of the sales of the game. And any other deductions that you want to think about, taxes, VAT, returns, we're talking about the actual money that you would, you would get in a check coming from your platform holders. So I, I flip this around from the way that we usually look at it. Usually we, we put this the other way. We say, well, revenues have to be greater than costs. And there's a particular reason that, that I, I started off by focusing on what the costs are. And, um, and, and why you want to think about it that way. And we'll see uh, how this comes into play in a little while. So, okay, how do you determine costs? Well, um, the primary one is going to be, you know, your developer time. Um, it's going to be the single largest component. I am going to suggest to you that from the very beginning, you track everything. All of your coding time, your art time, your discussions time, um, time that you spend in your meetings. You're going to need this information. For one thing, you'll need it to plan out how much time your next game is going to take. But there are a couple of other reasons that, that you want to want to be aware of this. And, and you need to understand that in a very real sense, while it is a cliche, time is money. But, but how do you assign a value? How much is an hour of your time worth? And, and one of the ways that we can, uh, we can look at it um, is to ask your fellow developers. What's the going rate for game developers? If you uh, weren't working on your own title or if you uh, weren't part of, a, of an independent studio and you were working for a game company in the area, what would that time be worth? Um, what's the going rate for people with similar experience and skills? And, and this last point is something that I'm also going to emphasize um, and it's going to become a, a reoccurring theme here. There are plenty of ways that you can do your research online looking at sites such as Glassdoor or, or job sites to, to determine the, the going rate for developers, but there's a better approach and we'll cover that later on. Okay, so let's talk about your business network. Um, and if, you, uh, if you're going to be successful in game development, um, whether you're, you're, you view yourself as a coder, an artist, um, as a as CEO of the company, um, whatever your role is, you are going to want to build up a business network. It's valuable. It has relevant sources of information. Remember that we were talking about wages and, and, and how much the value of your time is? Well, the, the easiest way for you to figure that out um, in your particular region for people of your similar, similar uh, experience and skill set is to find someone find several someone's <clears throat> who are who are just like you and ask them what they're getting what they're making what they're getting paid it also enables you to share resources you may find out that you have a lot in common or working towards common goals there are plenty of times that uh, you become stronger by pooling those resources together depending on what your situation is um, connecting with other game developers might land you a, a job or offer um, if that's if that's something that you're looking for. And uh, particularly at this time, at this time more than, than any other time that I remember in this, in this time of the virus and, and all of the unsettled conditions around the world, it, having a business network, is it's an antidote for loneliness. It, it, this is a serious issue in the world of game development. So how do you start off by building your business network? Well, there are a couple of tools. You can look for your local IGDA chapter as, as one example. Um, you can do a search for game companies in your area if you don't know them already, and then, then reach out and contact them. You can use social media. Um, for me, in, in my business world, um, LinkedIn is my preferred path, um, but Twitter is, is also really useful. Um, you should be, be talking to other uh, developers there. And uh, you might want to take a look around to see if there are relevant uh, Facebook groups. When you, when you make contact with somebody, you find somebody that, uh, that you think is interesting, you would, you would like to talk to them, you'd like to, to get information from them. Um, one of the things that, that I always stress is uh, be candid, be upfront, be truthful. You might want to start off by saying, hey, 
I'm a, I'm a game developer just starting out. I'm trying to build my business network. Would you have a few minutes to, to help me out by answering some questions? Always be frank about what your experience is or, or, your, or your lack of experience um, and the nature of your request. If you're looking for help, be sure to say, I'm looking for help. If you're, if you're like many developers, um, an introvert, uh, reaching out to somebody that you don't know, making that initial contact can really be hard. And I do not, um, I do not downplay what a challenge that is for, for most people. But that said, it's, uh, it's almost always something that's worthwhile and it, it, it has a lot of benefits both professionally and uh, if, you're, if you're lucky, um, fortunate, uh, if, you're, if you're lucky, it can also have benefits for you personally. So, okay, back to some of the number stuff, um, cost equation. Uh, you've now uh, made you may, now made the first step. You've had a, a sense of of what um, developers with your skill set um, in your region um, expect in terms of compensation. You've you've started out building um, some of your business network, and so now you have a, a number that you can plug in there. The basic cost equation is the value of time. Um, multiplied by the number of hours. So let's use an example. Um, you and two friends work on your game for two years. You each devote as much time as you can, but it's it's kind of uneven. <clears throat> Track the number of hours that you put in for game development. You can do some conversions. Um, the average full-time work week is is 40 hours, and that, uh, that number of 40 hours is uh, based on five days of, of eight hours each. Um, a man month is the number of hours, you know, typically worked in a month. Um, some variations here. Uh, the European Union defines it as 140 hours. The United States definition is closer to 160 hours. Um, but again, it's it's pretty much ballpark between those two. And then there's there's annual time. Again, there's some variation. But generally we we think about um, we think about a a year having two thousand working hours. So that's that's fifty weeks less two weeks of vacation, right? So 52 weeks in a year, figure two weeks of vacation, that gives you 50 weeks times 40 hours per week. It's not, it's not really rocket science. Um, so why are we, we stressing this? Well, these, these concepts are very often foreign to developers. Um, you know, you typically get into crunch mode and you, you start working um, as long as it takes to, to solve an issue. Um, so why is this kind of tracking important? Why is it, why is it relevant? Well, you're going to need this for your own growth and your own professional development. You really need to, to, to think about time, um, both your time and the time of, of other team members as a commodity that you can, you can only spend so much of it. But there's another reason behind this. Um, if you are ever going to be showing your game, if you're ever going to be looking for a deal um, with a publisher, or to work with a funding company like Exola or some of the other companies that provide funding. These are the kinds of things that they are going to, to want to ask. Um, they, want, they want you to know this stuff and they want you to be prepared for it. By coming in and, and talking about how many man months of labor it takes to, um, to create a game, what your, what your typical development schedule is based on your, your past history, you sound like you know what you're talking about. That makes the person at the other end that you're asking to, to you know, contribute money or funding or however you want to think of it, um, a little bit more comfortable that they're dealing with somebody who's, who's professional and who's actually going to get the game um, out the door. So you want to have this kind of information at your fingertips. And you also want to be able to use some of the buzzwords like average work week, um, uh, FTE, full-time equivalent, and, uh, and, and man months. That, that kind of thing makes you sound more professional. Okay. So, so that's, that's our cost equation. The other side of it was uh, our revenue uh, equation. Remember, costs are, are going to be less than you know, projected revenues. That's the way we, we look at it. So let's start off with some terms, again, that you want to have at your fingertips. Gross revenue. Gross revenue is the sale price multiplied by the number of units sold. And I, I'm using Steam um, as an example here simply because the numbers are, are easy to work with. Let's assume that you think you're going to sell a thousand units on Steam um, at ten dollars each. So gross revenue from that would be ten thousand dollars, right? One thousand times ten dollars. <throat> the net revenue, the amount that you're actually going to get paid, 
is equal to your gross revenue less allowable deductions. And, um, and guys, please make a note about that allowable deductions. We're going to come back to that. So there's storm, store fees. Um, everybody knows that, that Steam retains 30% as an example. Um, that's pretty much uh, the industry standard, or at least a baseline, although you have you know, some significant variance on that, like the Epic Store. Um, other things that are allowable deductions, returns, fraud, um, et cetera. So if you start off and say, well, your game is, is absolutely great, nobody returns it, there's no fraud involved in it, um, you don't have any taxes or VAT taken out, um, then your net revenue would be the, the $10,000 from gross revenue less the 30% of Steam, and it would be $7,000. It'll actually be less than that because you will have returns and you will have fraud, et cetera. Other allowable deductions. Well, taxes and VAT are, are pretty much standard. But if you sign a deal with a publisher, there's often a paragraph in the contract that defines what those deductions are. And you want to spend quite a bit of time going over that and making sure that you are comfortable and that you understand what you can actually expect to get paid out of that deal with a, with a publisher. So in the old days of retail, one of the major deductions was marketing development funds or, or MDF. Um, you had to play, pay places like, um, like GameStop to display your game. And the more you paid, the better the display would be. But, you know, you're laying money out in advance. Um, other kinds of things that you want to be leery of, you just want to make sure you understand completely is, uh, is a marketing expense. So many years ago, um, working, working at Stardock, we signed a, a contract with a publisher. And um, one of the allowable deductions was marketing expense. Well, that sounded good to me. I mean, we wanted them to market our game after all. Um, but I didn't really ask for the detail of, of what that was. It turned out that um, I was paying um, the salary of their marketing person. That was all coming out of revenues derived from selling my game. But uh, mine wasn't the only game that they were selling. Every single person that signed a contract that was that was identical with mine was also paying the same amount um, for their marketing person. They had the same deduction going across uh, everybody's um, everybody's revenues. And uh, while that was certainly inappropriate, um, it was something that they were able to get away with because I'd signed a contract um, without without really looking at what the fine print was. So, so that's something you really want to be careful. You really want to be careful in thinking about what the difference is between net revenue and gross revenue. Okay. So how do you forecast revenues? And this is a, a challenging part. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm using Steam primarily as my example, but there are equivalents across mobile, across, you know, every, every game, uh, variant that you can think of. Um, you're probably going to have to do some research on your own, but but let me give you um, a template for that. So how can you project the number of units you're going to sell? Well, say you can start off by finding comparable titles um, in the same genre um, from similar size developers. There's a, a fair amount of data available online. Um, I give Steam Spy as, as one example. But the, the best way to be able to really come up with sales projections is through your business network, is through networking. Find somebody that has actually shipped a game that you're thinking our game is, is just like that and get a sense from them of, of how many units they sold, um, what, their, what their net revenue was on that. Uh, those are things that it, it's, it's tough to ask those things, but you really want to have a, that relationship built out and you want to be explicit about why you are asking. Tell them that you're trying to be able to come up with a reasonable forecast for how your game will do. Um, so you really want to understand uh, how many units your game can be expected to sell and that's going to be the basis for, for making some sound um, business decisions. It's also going to be um, a, a key part of any pitch that you send out to, to publishers. Um, so if you are working on a, um, 
a Japanese style novel, you probably don't want to say, well, my game is going to sell as much as many units or, or is going to make as much money as, oh, I don't know, Fortnite. Um, that's probably something that, that would get you laughed out of the room. You want to have something that is, is close to, that is equivalent for yours. Um, so you know, your projection should be based on similar titles, roughly equivalent studios. Um, and and that's that's the best way that you can really come come up with uh, with uh, those numbers. Okay, how do you find comparable titles? Well, I um, I, I I wasn't really kidding um, for for making that uh, that visual novel um, uh, uh, reference. So let's say if I was hired as a consultant for an independent studio working on a visual novel, um, the first thing that I would probably begin by doing is heading over to itch. I look at the titles and I find the one or the ones that are closer to the game that my client is working on. Clicking on that gives me a link to the developer studio. And in, in some cases, you can find um, their contact information directly from their, their itch account. In many cases, you're going to get a Twitter handle. Um, so you start off by reaching out and asking if they can spare some time. And again, this is something that I, I touched on earlier. I believe in always being um, honest and transparent. So start off by saying, "Hi, I'm an indie developer," or, or in this case, "I'm a consultant working for an indie developer, and I'm working on a game similar to your title." And mention their title. Would you be able to spare a couple of minutes to help me by answering some questions? So, so two things that I always talk about about cold communications. Cold communications being either cold calling. Um, reaching out to somebody on Twitch, reaching out to somebody through LinkedIn, um, contacting them via an email on their developer site. Always be clear that you're asking for help and then emphasize that you're not looking to take up a lot of the other person's time. Time is always precious. Get to the point and, and don't waste time. Um, I usually would not stop by reaching out to a single developer with a single title. I'm going to find as many as seem appropriate. And if I get lucky and establish contacts with all the developers that I, uh, that, that I contact this way, well, that's given me a fantastic start on building up my network of contacts. Um, but you don't need to begin by, by browsing itch or steam. If there's a particular title, that influenced you to, to get into game development, that, that you first played and said, I want to make something like that. That is absolutely a great place to start. And don't be ashamed to say, I'm an indie developer and your game influenced me to become a developer. Reach out and explain how influential the developer was to you. It's, uh, it's, it's flattery, but it's good. And in, you know, in a case where, where a game title has influence you to go into development, that flattery is sincere. So, okay. All right. So we've got a, a framework. Um, we've reached out to other developers. We've got a sense of how much um, the rates are for people of a similar skill set in your area to you. So um, we've, we've tracked our number of hours that we're putting into a game. Um, we have all of the other costs established. And so we're able to learn through our research that the best price for a game similar to ours is, is about $5. Um, further, the low end of sales is about 2,000 units, and the high end is, is 8,000 units. Well, if you add 2,000 and 8,000 and you divide by two, you come up with an average of about 5,000 units for our model. And we're going to sell our game only on Steam. Again, I'm, I'm just doing that. Um, this isn't a commercial message for Steam. I'm just doing that because the numbers are easy to work with. So the equation becomes 5,000 times $5 times 70%. So remember, we're calculating net here. The reason I use 70% is Steam is going to take off their 30%, right? So 5,000 times $5 times 70% becomes $17,500 in projected net revenue. So in this, this information in hand, we can now start off by answering the question, how long should I spend developing the game? And remember, the unsaid part of that is, how long should I spend developing the game and still be profitable? Um, let me again emphasize, these are just made up numbers. I'm using $5 and $10 throughout the presentation um, simply because it makes the calculations easier. So we now have a budget for, for creating our game. We know that we want to keep costs below that $17,500 projected revenue. So 
We've got that budget, and if our costs are less than that and our sales projections are, in fact, accurate, we'll be profitable. It turns out that all the tools we need to create our game are free for use. Um, we're fans of Doki Doki Literature Club, and it turns out that the tool that they used was RenPy. Um, no cost and even support is free via the forums. Uh, so we have no other costs besides our labor. Further, it, it turns out conveniently for us that the going rate for developers in our area with our level of expertise is $17.50 per hour. Again, why did I come up with that number? Because it makes it easy to work with. So we want to create our game in 1,000 hours or less. If it takes less than, than 1,000 hours, we can assume that we'll be profitable. If it takes more than 1,000 hours, well, it's going to be um, our loss leader. So I said that the business philosophy helps you make decisions about every aspect of the game, including design. We now have a goal of creating the game in a thousand hours or less, and now you need to examine your work habits. It turns out that you average 20 hours a week working on your game as a one-person studio. Again, this is just for the sake of convenience. It means you want to complete the game in 50 weeks or less. Um, if you look at that and think that that is, in fact, an achievable goal, that you are going to make the game that you want in 50 weeks or less, you're all set. You now have the start and end points for your development schedule, and you can develop milestones to fit in that game. There are certain things that you, you always know as milestones that... Um, that you're, you want to be able to predict. Um, you know that you'll have a beta phase, you'll have an alpha phase. You know that you know there, there, there are certain goals that you need to accomplish and you want to lay that out. Uh, a thousand hours, saying that you want to create a game in a thousand hours of work time is, is just a concept. Um, it, has, it has no more um, uh, reality to it than the underpants gnome cartoon. Uh, a milestone, in contrast, is a goal with a specific time frame. So uh, again, um, saying that you're going to spend 20 hours a week for four weeks to learn the software um, and that some of the Python that you learned that you need to learn in order to use the, the tools that you want is something that, that you're going to be able to keep track of. Um, you've now got a milestone that, that makes sense. If you are able to do that within 20 hours, you are on track. If it takes you longer than that, then you need to, to reevaluate how much time you're spending on things. Um, the purpose of this is, is, is a couple of fold. It really helps you with, with one single thing. It helps you to gain and, and maintain focus ab about your game. Um, milestones are, are of a tremendous benefit for any studio, especially um, especially a studio where, where there's, there's only one person. You can get lost in the minutiae of things. But long term, if you are ever going to make a pitch to a publisher and you walk in there and you're able to say, look, I've done a game before. This is what I learned from it. These are the milestones that I set for my next title. It shows that you have thought out your plan and it's going to give them a, a greater feeling of comfort that you're actually going to achieve your goal and ship the game. So, okay, um, I've presented a lot of information to you. Um, let, me, uh, let me suggest to you some of the tools that, that you can use uh, and, and really use as resources. Twitter. Um, in looking to build up your network, Twitter is the easiest way to reach fellow developers. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, until you're, you're a known commodity, um, your direct messages may be ignored. Um, you know, if you're, if you're talking to people who are uh, popular within the industry, assume that they got a lot of those messages. And, um, and that's, that's probably the single biggest drawback for, for, for Twitter. It's really hard for, for anyone to separate um, the signal, the things that you want to hear, from the noise, the chatter that's going on around there. For that reason, um, I, I really do recommend LinkedIn. Um, many developers ignore LinkedIn because it has that business focus, but, but that's its very strength. You can search by company, you can search by name, you can get a person's title and background before you reach out. Um, also, and, and, I, and I tell people this, don't ignore this. Once you have a network, you can ask for introductions. You can get referrals directly through Twitter to, to some, uh, directly through LinkedIn, I'm sorry, to, uh, to new people that you want to meet. And email. Um, 
might seem funny and it might seem very antiquated to you that I'm calling out email as a valuable tool, um, but writing a, a business email that gets a response um, is, is really becoming a lost art. And, and notice that I'm, I'm emphasizing, you know, getting a, a response. So some tips for writing an effective uh, email. Know your audience. Do not write generic emails. Um, let me start off by, by, by telling you that um, anytime that I get a, an email and it doesn't seem to be specific to me, um, it gets about three seconds of my attention that goes into my spam filter. Um, be focused. Get to the point right away. Uh, use the, the person's name. Um, use it early and use it often. Uh, if I'm writing an email to, to my buddy Dan Long here, um, I am going to use the word Dan um, not only as an introduction to the email, but if there are things that I am asking Dan specifically to help me with, I'm going to say, Dan, I, I need your help on this. Use key words, um, words like help, advice, referral. Those are, those are attention getters and those are, are action items. And um, I tell people this all the time. The hardest part about an email is getting the person at the other end to open it. The subject line should be your friend. So if, if somebody is writing an email to me, um, something like, Larry, new developer seeks your advice. Why should they use my name in the subject? Well, for one thing, I immediately know it is not spam. Second of all, if I, if I see the email, um, and I look at a, a subject like new developer seeks your advice. I know what the email is about before I even open it. If I'm inclined to, to provide advice to new developers, and personally I am, that is an email that I will open 100% of the time. Let me, um, let me tell you a, a true story. Um, I was meeting uh, two friends, two uh, developers um, who, who I've, I mentor through the IGDA, and, and I've helped them um, with their studio. Uh, we were going out uh, for dinner one evening, and um, while I was waiting for them to get there, I received an email. This email that I looked at on my phone had to be at least six lengthy paragraphs of closely written text with no breaks between the paragraph. I, I look at it on my phone. It is just a wall of text. There's no spaces between the paragraphs. Uh, it, it's just a solid block. If I wasn't waiting for my dinner companions, I probably would have deleted it right away. But but I had a couple of minutes while they were uh, parking their car and coming to the restaurant. So instead, I replied saying, um, I'm sure that you're asking me for something, but I have no idea what you want. Um, it actually was from a streamer um, on Mixer uh, who was asking me for a key for one of my games. And... Um, that all the information that I needed was buried in that, that email, um, that it was a streamer, that they had a fairly significant audience, that they were looking to uh, show off one of the titles that I was promoting at the time. Um, and and I, I came back and I said to them, you know, um, if the email had said, hi, I'm a streamer with an audience of you know, 2,000, and I'd like to ask you for a key, they would have gotten a response immediately from me. It was a perfectly reasonable request, but they were so insecure about sending me the email that they told me a whole bunch of things that were irrelevant and that I, I really didn't care about. But more to the point, in my initial read of the email, I had no idea what they wanted from me. So keep your emails short, pointed, relevant. Okay, a um, couple of, of tools that I want to put out to you. Um, first of all, uh, the IGDA.org. Um, I, uh, I, I am an active IGDA member. Um, our IGDA branch here in Las Vegas has uh, about 500 members in it, ranging from people that work for our various studios to college students. Um, it is a great place to meet and to interact and to, uh, to ask for help. If I am a, a student or a fledgling developer and um, I have the opportunity to connect with an organization that has as members some of the significant studios in my area, I am absolutely going to do that. Um, I mentioned Steam Spy, and that's a, a great place for, for Steam stats. Um, Gamasutra.com. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody um, reads that, 
uh, but I certainly recommend that uh, along with, you know, Polygon and uh, uh, PC Gamer, um, Kotaku, uh, although um, perhaps less Kotaku these days than, than in the past, but um, those are sites that, you know, have, have industry gaming news while Gamma Sutra focuses on the business of games. Um, and another uh, great resource is uh, the Powell Group Consulting site, their online business matchmaking events. Uh, clearly, you're aware of that or you wouldn't be here, um, but it's a great way of connecting indie game developers with publishers, and those tools are all available for you. Um, that's, uh, that's what I've got. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. So Benjamin asks, when starting out, how do developers access data that can be valuable to marketing or even development? Any good resources for industry outsiders? So so a couple of things. But Benjamin, I'm going to tell you that the, the best answer that I can give you on that is, is, you know, in my presentation, connect with the people in your area. Um, connect with people that are making games similar to yours and ask them, ask them firsthand. But again, you know, you can look at resources like Steam Spy. If you're looking in the mobile games industry, um, you know, you get at least some parameters of how many times similar games have been downloaded. Um, that will that will give you some information. But but sincerely, and I, I'm going to say this over and over again, the best thing that you can do is develop your business network. Find people that are making games similar to yours and connect with them. They will give you the most relevant and up-to-date information. Um, also, if you're able to establish a relationship, you know, always ask them about uh, what the tips for success are and um, what things they wouldn't do again. But, but again, there's, there is no substitute for building up a business network. So Nightwolf asks, when regarding developer time, should you include a learning phase or just a development phase, seeing as different teams with different skill sets may have different development time costs based on learning, developing, or outsourcing, which may skew their worth rate? Absolutely. And, and you should be aware that, that um, the number of hours that it takes you to make a game of a certain quality as your first game and the number of hours that it will take when it's your fifth game in the same genre um, are, are going to be very different, but you should include the learning phase. You should include the development phase and you should look at that, um, you know, certainly break that out and things that you want to look for as a, as an ongoing studio is that as you continue to make games, assuming that the games are, are similar, that you're going to see a decrease in the amount of learning phase, that you're going to see a decrease in the development phase, but there is always going to be um, some new things that you need to learn. There are always going to be things that um, that when you do a post-mortem on your first game, you're going to say, this is something that I should have done differently. And there's going to be a certain amount of learning and development um, involved in that, even as you go forward. Then Rich says, how does someone's sales forecast in light of the current pandemic period? And also if the game doesn't have a comparable game? Well, um, I would, I would say to you, I'm going to take take those two questions in a reverse order. I would say to you, um, given the thousands and thousands of games that are out across um, every platform, if you don't find something comparable, you're just really not looking hard enough. Um, and, and I say that in a, in a friendly way, but there are going to, going to be games. Um, I'm, nothing is really created in a vacuum these days, but let me also take the first part of it. Um, if you have been tracking sales through places like, oh, Super Data um, has got some great uh, numbers for you. New Zoo is another source of numbers. You know, the answer to how do you track uh, sales in this time of the pandemic is that um, this has been a period of boom for the game industry. Um, staying home and playing video games is probably the way to stay safest these days. So let me get the next one here. You got a lot. You got a lot of good questions. So from our good friend Joseph Lieberman, how you doing, man? So on the subject of emails, the advanced version is to consider the nationality of who you send it to. In Japan, for instance, it's somewhat rude to jump straight to biz, straight, straight to biz, but keep it short. Um, you're a hundred percent right, and that is a great point. I'm going to have to incorporate that into into the the next time I, I deliver this presentation. You're right; you do have to keep those things um, in contact. H however, I will say this: um, by and large, uh, the indie game community, uh, as a, a, as a generalization, we are pretty forgiving. Um, 
I uh, overlook uh, spelling mistakes um, in emails that come to me uh, if they're if they're relatively few, um, in the hopes that my clients will overlook my uh, spelling mistakes. Um, boy, uh, spell check can really be the enemy sometimes. Um, but you're right; you do have to take that into account. Another thing um, to to amplify what Joseph said: you need to be aware of different time zones. Um, you know, if you're if you're writing to somebody that's halfway across the world. Uh, don't expect an immediate response. You might get it. It might be surprising, but um, you know sometimes your uh, your midnight can be there nine a.m. So those are things to take into account. But but I would say to you, you're you're one hundred percent correct. Um, you do have to allow for for cultural differences. So if anybody else has got a question, we still got a, a couple of minutes here. Um, let us know. Larry can share his wisdom with us live. Uh, and so uh, Rich said he's working with tabletop games and starting six feet games to deal with getting people to connect remotely. Uh, yeah. And, and that's what we're doing now. I mean, we've seen a huge spike in things like tabletop simulator and a lot of the, you know, board games that we can already find on, uh, on mobile, especially the iPad is a wonderful board gaming platform. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's the that's on the B two C side. On the B on the B two B side, there's always our you know our events, a lot of these other digital events, and our Discord as well. I, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna also add, um, Rich, uh, that I don't think we know yet, or or we have really accepted um, how long lasting the the change the changes um, being brought on by this this virus are going to be. Um, Night Dive Studios has always been 100% uh, uh, remote work. Um, we all work from, you know, we all we all work from from home. Um, that's that's the way our, our company is. That was a very different and something that that some of our partners found, if not unacceptable, at least questionable uh, about Night Dive. Uh, that was before March and April. Um, by April, many of those same companies were, were asking us about best practices. And I, and I say that not jokingly. Um, I have said a number of times, you're not going to be able to get the, the toothpaste back in the tube. Now that people have, have begun to work remote, um, with major companies like Google announcing that, um, that people are going to continue to work remote through next summer. So, so a year hence, Google employees are still going to be working remote. Um, you're going to see those changes uh, impact cultures uh, around the world. More and more people are going to be working from home, if not if not full time, um, we'll be working from home at least a couple of days a week. I think that standards about, hey, I'd like to request uh, an opportunity to work from home are going to be much more forgiving. I think people are going to understand that. So I think that's a change. But I also think that that one of the other changes that you're going to see, um, and Jay kind of alluded uh, to it, is that is that physical goods, um, it's great if they can be shipped to your home. But if they require you going into a store, that um, people are going to be hesitant to do that for quite some time. All right, we've got a good question. Well, a couple of good questions coming in right here from Obelitus Games. What advice would you give to an indie company that has a game out on the market that is out in early access and is looking for funding or a publisher? So the first thing that I would tell you is that that business model where, where the game is already out in early access or, and I'm not saying this is necessarily equivalent, but, um, or, or where there's been a Kickstarter for a game that, that publishers um, are, are a lot more forgiving of that. They're that, that the level of acceptance from major publishers um, is, has, has grown on that. I, you know, I would say uh, Obsidian is the, is the perfect example of that, uh, of, of hybrid, business models for, for a number of their titles. Um, so that's the first thing. What I would tell you about that is um, to look at things like your early access numbers, um, things like wish lists, um, not as uh, things that you want to disclose at the end, but that you want to incorporate as part of your marketing. Uh, certainly you want to show them, say, hey, look, these are the number of people that had faith in my game. This is the, the type of response that I'm getting from the early access market, and that's why you should partner with us. All right, let's see. There, there's another question right here uh, from Play Hard Games. We'll pop that up. Hey, Larry, what are the ABCs for starting a studio from scratch and being financially successful? The golden questions. Oh, absolutely. Um, number one, document everything 
from, from the moment that you decide to start your studio, track your time, track your ideas, write everything down, keep it in a journal. And I would suggest to you, um, paper and pencil is, is, is fine in the old days, but I would suggest that you want to make this a living journal because it's something that you're going to come back to. Um, write out your, your game design documents. Put down everything that you can think of all the time. Write down titles that are similar. Keep a list of that every time you see a new game coming out that's that's in the same genre that you're you're looking at. Um, keep that stuff. And then go back and read that stuff and think about what you would have done differently six months down the road on that. Um, the uh, the other part that I'm going to say to you is that if you if you do not have a, a business focus, then then see if you can find somebody that will will help you to to gain that. Um, if there's somebody in the area, they may not know the gaming world or they may not know the sector of the gaming world um, as well as as you do. Um, but uh, but they're going to ask you the questions and force you to think about things in a way that 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 might seem unnatural to you now, but in a couple of years is going to become your accepted way of thinking. So again, journal everything. And then um, one lesson, you know, from my presentation, let the maths be your friend, track everything and, and look at the, at the numbers frequently, how much time you're spending, what your revenue goal should be pricing, how you're going to make money. Those are all things that you want to think about from the beginning and that, that you want to have come up every day. Okay, well, people, Larry's time is up, but we're gonna. I'm gonna do one more question because this will help you out for the people that are asking questions. Um, how can you be reached off conference, Larry? Um, hate to tell you this, but I am kind of busy. But I'm um, probably the the easiest way to uh, connect with me um, is uh, something that I showed in my presentation. I do um, accept a lot of uh, requests via LinkedIn. Please do mention. Um, again, when you request on LinkedIn, I probably should have talked about this uh, in a little bit more detail. Mention that you heard my presentation and you want to connect with me. That should be the number one line because that will differentiate you from, from people that are just spamming me. But LinkedIn is probably the best way to get a hold of me. You can also find me on Twitter. Um, I prefer not to be contacted for, for business stuff on, on Facebook simply because, well, it's Facebook. <laughs> That's funny. All right. So yeah, so rude. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this is awesome. Let's see. Let me look at who's coming up next. Uh, hey, uh, have... Jay and, and Dan, um, it will it will take me uh, until tomorrow, but I will um, post a copy of my presentation, both um, as it was presented and with my notes pages, um, and I'll send you guys the link on that. Okay. That'll, that'll be perfect. Next, we have uh, Martin Spans. 10 rules for business and mobile games and a bonus AMA, a bonus ask me anything. So make sure that you guys like or follow depending on what platform so that you get notified when the next speaker or the next speakers go live. We thank you so much, Larry. We appreciate you so much. Cheers. Bye-bye.